This week on The Inside Story, Chinatown, living in America, a traditionally Asian enclave in dozens of American cities, home to families and legacy businesses passed through generations. What's changed and what stayed the same? See how one of the oldest Chinatowns in the country is getting a high-tech upgrade in the wake of the pandemic. Now on The Inside Story, Chinatown, living in America. Welcome to the Inside Story. I'm Tina Trin in New York. We're here in Manhattan's Chinatown, a distinctly Asian neighborhood where just a few years ago, the day-to-day -day scene was quite different. Back then, New York was the American epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic. And here in Chinatown, community members experienced it twice over. Not just with the disruptions caused by the virus, but with the racism and xenophobia that surfaced alongside it. It was a difficult time for this mostly immigrant community. But in response, a new movement emerged on social media, led by first and second generation Asian Americans who used their digital savviness to bring about a new appreciation for Asian culture and identity. In the next half hour, we'll meet a few of the folks who are breathing new life into one of the oldest Chinese ethnic enclaves in the US. And we'll hear from everyday people on the street about what Chinatown means to them. Unfortunately, many of Chinatown's small businesses folded during the pandemic. But for one store owner, what ultimately sustained her business was family and community and a passion for a particular drink. Here in Manhattan's Chinatown, there's an energy in the air. More than two years since the start of the pandemic, the neighborhood is experiencing a rebirth. It's a wild grown tea from my family's hometown. Leading the revival is Chinatown's younger generation, many of them first-generation Americans, the sons and daughters of immigrants who have the hustle and drive of a typical New Yorker. I am the second-generation owner of a intergenerational store in Chinatown called Grantian Imports. We specialize in tea and Buddhist and cultural goods. Lu's father started the business in 2006, after his first trip back to China since immigrating to America. He caught up with a lot of his friends that he had not spoken to in nearly a lifetime um, through tea. He has kind of seen the product transform from just a household drink that everyone drinks into more of like a lifestyle. And so he thought it was a very good opportunity to bring it back to America. To the outsider, tea may seem ubiquitous in Chinese culture, but it's just as easily overlooked. Like if you go to a dim sum restaurant, um, they would give you very, very low quality, cheap, free tea, um, which would just taste like water. Her father was on a mission to change things, enlisting Alice and her sister to help. Every single time there was any sort of community fundraiser or a person running for any campaign or in school, there was some sort of event or show and tell or like a street fair looking for programming, we would do traditional Chinese tea ceremony performances. The pandemic, coupled with an increase in anti-Asian violence, have made the last two years undoubtedly difficult for Chinatown's small businesses. But that's where the generational differences in social media savviness have made a difference. Before the pandemic, we basically did not have a social media presence. And then since then, we've had to make sure to get on Yelp, make sure to go on Instagram, it's necessary that like, you know, the younger generation needs to step in for this because the only reason why it hasn't happened up till now is because our parents don't have the ability, the English ability, nor the technology skills in order to do that for themselves. Lou isn't alone. In recent years, her peers have launched a number of Chinatown-focused nonprofits to promote and preserve their beloved neighborhood. Their work is far from over. Unless we have like strong cultural institutions here, strong anchor businesses here to hold down the fabric of the neighborhood, it's very easily collapsible. Beyond just economic survival, it's a way for Lou to stay connected to her roots. 
I know a lot of Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, um, my generation, who are getting married. And what's quite sad is like what was considered a very traditional Chinese tea ceremony, um, they have like since had to adapt to just like drinking tea with their family at a dim sum parlor or just literally brewing whatever tea that they had around the house and or in a thermos and then serving it to everyone because they couldn't find a wedding tea gift set. Small businesses in a community of color, what they provide to the neighborhood is more than just the product or service that they provide, but also like that cultural knowledge and that ability to continue that cultural practice. For Lou, it's about finding new ways to keep old traditions alive. Um, it was a ghost town for the first year and a half or so. But over the last year, things have started to come back. Um, things are doing much better now, and all the tourists are back to New York in full force. Brooklyn and Queens, they all have their respective uh, Chinatown. So, but just, just to say, those Chinatowns are good, but they don't, they don't have the character of the New York Chinatown with the old buildings and with, with the old old timers. From the bakeries and restaurants to the shops and street vendors, there's lots to discover in Chinatown. And often the best way to explore it is on foot. But what happens when a once in a lifetime pandemic keeps foot traffic at bay and threats the livelihood of an entire community? For the two young women in our next story, venturing out takes on a whole new meaning. If you ever find yourself lost in New York City's Manhattan Chinatown, look for these two. Anna Huang and Chloe Chan are the Mod Street Girls. They give walking tours of the historic neighborhood, highlighting the small businesses that make it so unique. They used to be volunteer tour guides at a local Chinese American history museum. But when the pandemic shut down its operations, they decided to hit the streets. When we first started Mod Street Girls, honestly, we just missed giving tours. So we just focused on like, you know, doing these walking tours, but as we did more and more walking tours, we realized that sometimes even the locals don't know their own history. There were anti-Asian hate crimes back in, in the 1980s or 1800s, right? And it's happening again. We noticed that a lot of Chinatown walking tour guides were not necessarily from the community. And so we felt that us being second generation Chinese Americans, we wanted to tell our own story from our own perspective. We have a voice, right? We're storytellers who want to amplify the community. It's been a hit on Instagram. In just two years, their stories and photos of local Chinatown businesses have garnered 15,000 followers. We're trying to uplift like these older small businesses that might not be as tech savvy, that might not know social media. Us being like millennials, like we know how to use Instagram, we know how to use like Twitter, you know, so we can help raise awareness about their story, right? And like use our platform to advocate for them. But in a neighborhood that's become increasingly gentrified, striking a balance between old and new can be tricky chances the two can coexist. There are a lot of new businesses that are coming to the community that might not necessarily serve like the elderly working class community. But I think it's also important to remember that Chinatown is a tourist destination, right? That is how it can survive is through like the foot traffic, through like tourists spending money. And while some of Chinatown's oldest businesses have survived generations, Huang says family ownership wasn't always the objective. They started the shop so then they can have like a safety net for their family, right? But as their children grow up, right, they want them to chase the quote unquote American dream. Creating Mod Street Girls has given both a chance to reflect on their own lived experiences. I struggle with both identities, being Chinese and being American. And my mother decided to put me in Chinese dance because she was like, well, you have to be uh, cultured in some way in Chinese <laughs> culture. I think starting Mod Street Girls, I realized like it's so important to identify with my Chinese culture, but also I am American, that hyphen. It's important. I am Chinese American and there's no denying that. It's a duality that makes the stories and representation of this community all the richer.
children of immigrants have always grappled with identity, with some leaning more into the American part of their Asian American identity. The subject of our next story was largely shielded from the daily hardships of his immigrant father's life. But when his father passed, the family restaurant became a bridge between past and present. It's the dinner rush at Wohop Restaurant in New York City, and the cooks are busy prepping customer favorites like General Tso's chicken and beef lo mein. In this tiny basement eatery, the experience is definitely no frills. Photos and dollar bills covering nearly every inch of wall space serve as evidence of just how much New Yorkers love Wohop, said to be Chinatown's second oldest restaurant. David Leung is the majority owner of Wohop. His grandfather and father worked here for decades after immigrating to America. But Leung says he was never involved. I always knew that my father went to, to work uh, late at night, and I rarely saw him. He didn't bring his work home with him. I really didn't know what he did. Um, we rarely even went to the restaurant. About 10 years ago, Leung learned just how big of a role his father played at Warhop. I always thought he maybe was just uh, a manager. I didn't know that we actually owned the restaurant. For many children of immigrants, there's an unspoken understanding that parents toil and sacrifice to provide their children with a life that's better than theirs. He wanted his kids to just go to school, study, get good grades, that's it, you know, and not be burdened by anything else. But achieving the so-called American dream can sometimes distance first-generation Americans, like Leung, from their cultural identity, making it that much harder to pass down values and traditions to their kids. It's hard because everyone around them is also benefiting from the American lifestyle. My parents used to tell me, oh, we can't afford this, or we can't afford that. And I can't really say that to my kids now without lying. Wohop has given Leung and his children a way to reconnect with their roots. His daughter Chelsea runs the restaurant's Instagram account and designs its t-shirts. And Leung's son Mitchell helps run the restaurant's Facebook account. We get so many reviews on TripAdvisor, Yelp, and Google. And so many of them would say, I've been coming to you for 20 years, 30 years. My father first brought me here. My grandfather you know, first brought me here. For Leung, running Wohop is not only a family tradition, but also a homecoming. We have been here for so long. 10 -ish, maybe more than 15 years here minimum with my store. I only wish it could do better. I also hope some of the local community associations or some powerful people can help organize for Chinatown and do it better. This is my hope. Longtime businesses like Wohop are the heart of Chinatown, but many are still struggling to survive. Jacqueline Wang is chief operating officer of Welcome to Chinatown. It's a nonprofit that grew out of the pandemic to support Chinatown small businesses. Here's what she had to say about the last three years and the way forward. Why the need for this kind of organization? So you would be in Chinatown and, you know, stores were empty and people were scared to come into the neighborhood. But then you walk a few blocks into the Lower East Side or Soho and people are out at the bars, people are dining, it's full. Our founders, they went around, they were like, okay, we think the way we can help right now is to help businesses digitalize and get them on a platform so people can, you know, buy gift cards and come back. Um, and they were met with a lot of skepticism and they were met with a lot of like, you know, we don't, who are you? What do you want from us? What do you want in return? Why do you want to help us? You know, these two unknown young women speaking in like very broken Cantonese. I think those first experiences have really helped us develop our programming to this day, three years later. Um, we really work on building trust with business owners. And if we don't give small businesses in the community all the support, whether it's capital, whether it's um, you know training, whether it's just more access to information, that I think is key to make sure that this neighborhood is able to thrive and that we have Chinatown for future generations. I think the, the trust element is huge here, um, and it also kind of speaks to the generational divide. How did you begin to, to bridge that at such a really kind of dire time? Absolutely. I think um, the time and effort that our team of volunteers have put into building the trust is why we now are able to have these programs. We go door to door, we have translators, we have um, paper applications for our grant programs. We really come in and say, like, we're your partners in this. 
in working with these businesses, like what have you seen um, and how has Chinatown evolved over the last three years? Um, when we built our grant program in 2020, it was in direct response to learning that business owners were in super dire need. They weren't getting access to like PPF funding. They weren't getting access to funding coming from the city, from the state, um, for many reasons. The two main reasons being language barriers and technology barriers. So we realized like this funding is out there for them. It's just so hard for them to get to it. Um, as our grant program evolved and as like months and years went by, we slowly had more businesses being able to apply for more like forward-looking initiatives. And that's something that we are slowly now trying to encourage businesses to do. So understanding there's still a lot of things that need to be addressed to stay open, but we want to encourage them to like, you know, think about marketing, think about long-term sustainability projects, whether that's, um, you know, interior design, whether that's um, bringing on new staff members, whether that's digitalizing your point of sale system, like all of these things that businesses had absolutely no time to think about in 2020 are slowly being able to think about it. It's great on the one hand what you guys have done to um, raise awareness among the younger generation. And you see young entrepreneurs opening up storefronts. Um, and at the same time, you worry about the gentrification of Chinatown. Absolutely. Um, and like in all transparency, it's something that we struggle with every day as well. Um, we cannot lose the legacy of this neighborhood. I think that's why people gravitate towards Manhattan Chinatown specifically and all of the, like a lot of the Chinatowns in the US is because it has stayed, you know, so true to itself. And on the opposite end, you don't want it to be a neighborhood that is paused in time and kind of becomes a museum, right? I think it's something that we really are working to address in our upcoming small business innovation hub that will be part innovation hub, but part community space. Obviously, this is like a, a huge challenge that the neighborhood is facing, and a lot of it also comes down to like property prices. And there are a lot of vacancies, um, and making sure that one we get some you know entrepreneurs in there, and that they're ones that um, will honor the space and like be really thoughtful about how they're coming into this community that you know that already is here. Talk about the the small business innovation hub and how it can serve these small businesses. One thing that came a lot came up a lot in our focus groups was, and this especially the existing business owners, that there right now isn't necessarily a gathering space. And we realized that our focus group, some business owners were actually meeting for the first time in person. They know of each other, you know, they've done business together, but they really haven't had the time to like sit down and have this conversation about like, what are your struggles? These are my struggles. How can we build off of each other? Right? We had um a younger entrepreneur who has a barber shop in Chinatown and you know has really grown his like TikTok social media following and the um, current owner of a Cantonese spot that's been around for like decades and they were swapping ideas like he was like this is how you get on TikTok he was telling him this is how you run a business like there's this all of this information swapping that we weren't even really part of we just like facilitated this room and this group i think for business owners when you're in it when you're in your shop when you're in your restaurant it's hard to remove yourself and kind of like you know take a step back take a few feet above and, and look at it that way so we hope this space is um is an opportunity for them to do that if we can support them with the capital and the expertise from a you know a specialist or from consultants and help them test this marketing idea they have you know expand their catering business revamp their website all of these things um, Hopefully these will be more than just a band-aid for their business, but actually kind of build a foundation for them to move into like the next era of their business. The stories and rich history of Manhattan's Chinatown play a big part in its survival. But so did the new businesses who are writing its next chapter. We're here on Doyer Street. It's only a block long, but it has this distinct bend in the middle. Back in the early 20th century, this was known as the Bloody Angle. And it's where a lot of Chinatown gang fights and killings actually took place. 
Fast forward to today, where a colorful street mural greets visitors and a whole new generation of business owners are setting up shop here. We're gonna meet with two of them, the co-founders of Art Bean Coffee Roasters. Spencer Okada and Khan Tran are the co-founders of Chinatown's Art Bean Coffee Roasters. Like many independent coffee shops in America, there's art on the walls, specialty drinks made to order, and freshly roasted beans to take home. We have the concept where we mend art and coffee together, where we like to collaborate with artists and share, essentially share creativity. Location and timing are crucial in any new business. An art being opened during the pandemic in a Chinatown neighborhood still recovering from economic losses and lingering anti-Asian sentiment. I remember these past two years, even especially in 2020 when everything was so uncertain, was so scary, we don't know what's happening, and then like us by being Asian was being targeted. It was quite a scary time for everyone. The timing ultimately provided a sense of purpose for the business, which collaborates with up-and-coming Asian-American artists and gives back to charities that support the community. We wanted to be a part of something bigger than, than the drink, and so being in this space, it really kind of, it was kind of the key where we're able to do all of that and not just sit amongst another Starbucks or something. Art Bean is located on Doyer Street, one of the oldest streets in Manhattan's Chinatown. The block of barber shops, salons, and restaurants has evolved over the years, and businesses like Art Bean represent a new vanguard of young Asian American entrepreneurs who, with their shared histories, are bringing a new socially conscious, community minded energy to the neighborhood. We learned that there's a, actually a young generation of Asian American that live in Chinatown and they are be trying to connect with the older generation to think Chinatown, they're throwing a block party, they're doing like a night market, and welcome to Chinatown, they're doing like a lot just to help out with like existing business that was suffering through the pandemic. For Art Bean, it's about putting Asian twists on traditional favorites, like the ube latte, which gets its purple hue from a yam native to the Philippines. Some people don't consider themselves being creative, but some, sometimes I feel like if you just try something new, do something differently, can you find some creativity in your everyday life? And that is like a good space to be in, I think. For Art Bean Coffee, it's about finding inspiration in the everyday. I feel the future is very hopeful and very happy as well, because we can see many customers coming out to consume and spend money, coming out to see their friends. Also, the tourists are coming back. We are very, very optimistic. Also, we hope Chinatown, we see many new restaurants are preparing and launching. I feel a sense of thriving. That's all for now. Stay up to date with all the news at voanews.com and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at VOA News. You can find me on Twitter at Tina Trin NYC and catch up on past episodes at our free streaming service, VOA Plus. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you today's show, I'm Tina Trin. We'll see you next week on The Inside Story. times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture.